A completely different company now. So we are a uh, pharmaceutical company. And fortunately, I don't have to read this because the disclaimer was given earlier. We're focused on diseases like asthma and COPD, and we're spun out of the University of Southampton. And what we want to do is find breakthrough drugs for those diseases. And I mentioned asthma and COPD. But there are some rarer lung diseases as well, one of which I'll tell you a little bit more about. And our approach is, sorry, it meant to hit the laser. Our approach is that we've got a biobank of tissue that we have collected from volunteers with lung disease. And we believe this is the best way to identify new drug targets and test new drugs in the lab before we get into clinical trials. We want to prove concept and pass these assets over to large pharmaceutical companies. And we've done that uh, successfully with our first program that we licensed to AstraZeneca in 2014. And I'll give you an update on, on how that program is progressing. And then last year, we brought in our uh, second program. Uh, I'll give you an update on that as well. And we're looking to bring in some uh, new programs as well. Just to explain a little bit more about asthma and COPD and this rare lung disease. Asthma I wish I didn't keep doing that. Uh, asthma is a very common disease. Roughly 10% of the population uh, will have asthma. COPD is the collective term for emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Roughly 25% of uh, smokers will develop COPD, and it's a progressive disease which really ero erodes away at your lung function, um, and unfortunately, um, it, it's got a, a high mortality associated with it. Now, both of these diseases are substantial and have made companies like GSK and AstraZeneca billions of dollars over the years. And a successful drug in this space, uh, Advair for GSK at its peak was pulling in over $5 billion a year. Um, and AZ had a similar drug. So you can see that a breakthrough therapy in this market is going to be very attractive to the large pharmaceutical companies. Now, in this space, we are accepting that the generic versions of those drugs like Advair and Symbicort are now in the marketplace, and that roughly 80% of all of these patients are going to be very well catered for by the new variants of those drugs. And there will be, a, uh, you know, there would be some er erosion on uh, market share and profits in that zone. But it leaves 20% of these patients who need help. They are not, their disease is not well controlled, despite the best use of the existing therapies. And we're very focused on trying to help identify new drugs for this patient population. Uh, IPF, or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, is a rarer lung disease. And we'll also look at uh, diseases like cystic fibrosis as well. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this. Uh, roughly 100,000 people in the US, just to give you a, an idea of how uh, common the disease is, but it's nasty. It's worse than many cancers. So if, if you know someone who's got this diagnosis, you, they would probably wish they had a, a cancer diagnosis. So what is our approach? We have really picked up on the research that the academics in Southampton uh, started, and they became very well established in the ac academic space because they moved away from two classic um, research platforms, one being the mouse and the other being cell lines. I'll start with the cell lines. If you're a researcher and you want to dig into a disease, you grow cells in a lab and you can identify new drug targets and test drugs against those cells. And a lot of cell lines have come from cancer patients. So someone doing respiratory research, uh, working on cells uh, which have come from a cancer patient won't necessarily tell you much about asthma or COPD or IPF. You can do res respiratory research, but you're not drilling down into the real disease. Um, mice are fantastic for doing research, uh, but they're generally almost identical to each other. I mean, looking around the room, you all look different, and you will have different lungs and all sorts of things going on, um, whereas your mice don't have that um, variability in them. You can genetically engineer mice to look like a human disease, but with some of these diseases, particularly IPF, we don't know what causes it. So if you don't know what causes it, how can you create a mouse model um, to replicate that disease in the lab? And similarly, with those severe asthma patients, no one really knows what's driving the disease in those patients. 
So our academics who founded the company went over here. Two of them are medical doctors. And they, were, they adapted a, a technique which was um, being used in the NHS, where you, oh, I've got a prop here, you put a tube um, with a little wiggly camera on up through the nose and down into the lungs. And you put this little thing up um, alongside that camera tube. And you can take little nibbles and we can show you this later on if you want. You can have a go with it. Um, <laughs> little nibbles of lung tissue from our volunteers who have asthma or different severities of asthma or COPD or IPF or CF. And then you can grow those um, cells in the lab in little dishes and really you're growing the, the lining of the lung in the lab and that enables you to do different things. And the key to this is that we know exactly what sort of patient those samples have come from. What's driving their disease? Is it pollution, allergies, viruses? And we're very interested in viruses, common cold viruses. Um, so this is what we call our biobank. And hopefully you can get an inkling into why this is a special research platform. We will test new targets and identify new targets. We will test new drugs against those targets. And we'll also develop biomarkers. So when we're doing clinical trials, we sort of pave the way by doing that work in the lab first. So we're not going blind into relatively expensive um, clinical trials. So that's what we do. Uh, and this is where we do it. So we're in Southampton. We are embedded within the NHS and university in infrastructure. There are landlords and our local collaborators. And in the middle of all this is something that looks like a private hospital. So our nurses and doctors can work in this space. And we just pay across the threshold fee. And it's great. We, we can do complicated clinical trials. But it's also good for the uh, researchers in Southampton because we're collaborating with them. And when we make breakthroughs, we publish with them. And that's good for their careers. It's good for everybody. Uh, and the university is a shareholder in the company. So we've got this new, unique infrastructure. How have we done with all this? Well, um, we've licensed our first program to AstraZeneca. And the first program uh, came out of an interest in this event here. This is one patient's lung function over a six month period. They happen to be in a uh, trial um, where they're testing one of AstraZeneca's drug, an inhaled steroid. And everything is fantastic. You know, they start off with very variable lung function, which is on the vertical axis here. And over time, Everything's looking great. You can see why this drug was putting in billions of dollars at peak. But then they bump into the common cold virus. It takes away their lung function and takes a couple of weeks to recover. This is what we call an exacerbation. Cold viruses are the biggest cause of these events in asthmatic patients. It's nothing to do with allergy or pollution. It's viruses which are the biggest problem. So the academics decided to grow those cells in the lab and infect those cells with a common cold virus. And they found that those cells didn't make enough of something that we all make when we get a cold, and it's something called interferon beta. And it, it's like the conductor of an orchestra. It drives an antiviral response. Uh, so these asthmatic cells were making about one third of the level, and by simply topping up with interferon beta, they could restore antiviral resp re, um, responses. You get less virus being produced by those cells that have been infected, and you get less cell death. And this has got potential in asthma and in COPD. So we're trying to solve a very expensive problem here. So the, 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 the message here is that if you're a cell and you've got, become infected by a virus, interferon beta is good for you. Interferon beta is already a drug. It's been given to multiple sclerosis patients for the last couple of decades and has been very good for companies like Biogen and Serono and, and now Novartis. Um, so what we were facing as a management team was to repurpose interferon beta, put it in into an, an inhaled form, and uh, progress it towards the clinical trial, which was going to excite a pharmaceutical company like AstraZeneca. And as, as I've told you already, we've been successful at doing that. To do that, we were starting from a nice place. We could go to someone and get, and get the drug that uh, was already being manufactured. We chose the one which we thought was best for inhalation. We asked people to breathe the drug in. We asked them then, 24 hours later, to cough into a, a Petri dish. Sputum is something we love. It's our currency. It's our blood, if you like, as a company. Uh, and then in that sputum, we could measure all sorts of things. I don't want you to pay attention or be intimidated by graphs like this. It is high science. But all these things are markers of an antiviral response. So in a, when there was no virus around, we could 
get people to inhale interferon beta, and we could trick the lungs into thinking there was a virus there. And all these graphs here show that that was ha indeed happening. So the next thing, because that was exciting, and it de-risks that step into a, what we call a phase two trial, where you try to show the drug is doing something helpful to real people. We had to show that when patients got a cold, that they would benefit from inhaling the drug. And this is what the pharma industry wanted to see. Uh, so we built up a pool of patients. We've got about 300 patients with asthma, and we've got all their details, measured their lung function and things like that. And then we wait for them to get a cold. Could be a week, could be a year. But roughly speaking, we get two to four colds per year as adults, so we didn't have to wait too long. And then we treated for two weeks with inhaled interferon beta, and we measured everything. This was an exploratory trial. We are very pleased with the result. We learned a couple of things. The most important thing is which patients get worse when they get a cold. And whilst we recruited from a fairly large population of asthmatic patients, it was the poorlier patients, roughly, or it was just under half of the people in the trial who responded to drug. So I don't want to, to focus on this too much. This is a measure of symptoms, and you can pick the slides up um, later on. But we saw a benefit on drugs. If you're on placebo, your asthma got worse. If you're on drug, you actually end up slightly better at the end of the first week. With lung function, so patients took one of those little tubes that you might have blown into when you see the GP home with them, and it had a little microchip so you could measure lung function. You can see on placebo, your lung function got worse for the first week, and then it starts to recover, whereas on drug, you're defending yourself against the virus. Your lung function um, has started to improve pretty much straight away. We obviously talked to all the large companies who might be interested in this, uh, but we were delighted to seal a deal with AstraZeneca, which has got over $200 million worth of uh, fixed payments, milestone payments, and royalties. And you know, those royalties are projected to bring in a substantial amount of money which eclipses this number. Uh, AstraZeneca are doing a confirmatory clinical trial that started uh, last year and is expected to read out in 2017. So that's our first program. The next program, and you know, having been successful, we, we set out to bring more programs in. So we could take things from early stage, we've got our technology platform, we can de-risk things, we can increase our confidence that this a new drug um, would work. And we've be assessed lots of opportunities. There's lots of rubbish out there. Um, but we've, uh, at any one time, we'll be working on things in the lab using our biobank to screen new opportunities. But we got into a conversation with an Australian company who had developed a drug which was uh, capable of, we, we believe, stopping a fibrotic process. And there's a disease where you get too much fibrosis, and it's a, it's a disease called um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And we've really just joined this party quite late. They're attracted by our biobank, and uh, we're predicting that we'll get into clinical trials, phase one clinical trials next year, because you know, they've done a lot of work already. So a little bit more uh, about this. Uh, and this area, I, there's a, uh, the more information that I'm going to go through in these slides, but hopefully you'll get a chance to read it um, afterwards. Uh, the target we're looking at is something called LOXL2. Don't get phased by that. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but fibrosis is an area of great interest to the pharmaceutical industry at the moment. And you've got some example deals here. We'll be in phase one next year. Gilead have um, bought two companies during phase in, when in, the drug was in phase one. They bought Aresto Biosciences outright for $225 million. Uh, they also, last week, announced that they bought Nimbus Therapeutics, $400 million up front, $800 million in future payments. Uh, if you get to phase two, where you've got a demonstration of e efficacy, you can get over the $1 billion threshold for your, um, when you're required. And if you get to the market, then you can be talking even bigger numbers. $8 billion have been paid by Roche for a company called Intermune. And as I guess as a, as a strategy, as a company, what we want to do, and we've got it with Interferon Beta, is have an asset which can be worth a lot of money so that we provoke some sort of event like this. A little bit more on IPF. I've talked about this being a, a disease of fibrosis. Um, your lungs, are, think of them like a sponge with a massive surface area. And if you lose that sponginess, you're going to find it difficult to ventilate and exchange gases in the lung. And that's what happens with these patients. It's, 
uh, they get too much fibrosis. You lose the sponginess and the, and the fibrosis actually gets in the way of gas transfer. So you can see it's bad news and patients asphyxiate uh, with this disease. I talked about it being worse in, um, you know, compared to worse than many cancers. Here are a list of very common cancers. Um, and you can see that the survival um, at five years is worse than the majority of these cancers. And it's only lung and pancreatic cancer where, you, where you're uh, worse off. Um, two drugs have been launched recently. This is the one that Roche bought for $8 billion after it had been launched. Uh, Boehring at Ingelheim have got a drug called Nintelinib. Uh, and these have just been launched and they're projected to bring in quite substantial revenues. Because, and that's what you can do with a, 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 what we call a niche or an orphan disease. Uh, so the, the, um, these drugs cost tens of thousands of dollars per patient per year. So why the interest in Loxel2? Uh, this is a, an enzyme that we all have in our bodies, and it's very useful if you cut yourself. Uh, so when you cut yourself, your body puts little fibers across the wound and the fibers are designed to pull the wound together and you need some stiffness and strength to that tissue. And the way the body does that, th these little squiggly things here are collagen fibers. And what LOXL2 does, this enzyme that we've all got, it sort of connects those fibers together in lines. So it turns it from sort of a spongier content, uh, sort of tissue to something which is what we call fibrotic. And this is stiffer and stronger. And these things here are called crosslinks. So LOXL2 causes crosslinks to occur in tissue. And this LOXL2 enzyme is found at higher levels in, uh, in patients or lung tissue from IPF patients. So what we want to do is inhibit this uh, LOXL2 enzyme. And that's what we've been able to do. So we signed the deal last year, and throughout this time, we've been working on these compounds that Pharmaxis had developed in our models. And here's the results of the first set of experiments. And expect more news flow to come from the models that we're running. But basically, if you um, just grow these IPF cells that we've collected from patients working with the academic team in Southampton and just let them grow, you get lots of crosslinks occurring. And then if you use increasing concentrations of this drug that Pharmaxis has developed, you can reduce the number of crosslinks from occurring. And we hypothesize that this will be very good for IPF patients. It will uh, delay the rate of fibrosis that occurs in these patients. Uh, and make, improve their prognosis. So the core terms of the deal with Pharmaxis is that oh, we've got to catch up. They've invested millions of dollars in developing these compounds. And what we're doing is we're using our models to um, increase confidence that it's worth progressing these, model, these compounds into the clinic. Uh, and over the next couple of years, uh, by the time we finish our phase one uh, clinical trials, we would have funded enough of activity to have caught up with their spend so that we can share the spoils of a transaction that we do with a large pharmaceutical company on a 50-50 basis. Now, this sort of approach, this LOXL2 inhibitor approach that we've got here could be very useful in other diseases such as liver fibrosis or kidney fibrosis. That's not our area of expertise, but some of the things we'll do to make progress in IPF will have benefit for liver and kidney fibrosis. So the deal has it that we'll get a share of um, this NASH is a liver fibrosis condition and kidney fibrosis. It's just a smaller share. Uh, we've got a lot of interest from pharmaceutical companies. So the CEO from Pharmaxis and myself have been co-presenting to pharma companies uh, and they're really interested in this, this target. They're also very interested in the models that we've got which um, have shown so far that this, these compounds will reduce the number of crosslinks occurring in, these, uh, in the tissue. We're looking for new opportunities, and our ideal opportunity that we want to find is something that's got a bit stuck, whether it's stuck because large pharma got stuck because they didn't have access to the models, or whether it's an academic group or a small company, and we want to unstick it by increasing confidence in uh, the development program. In terms of financials, we're a biotech company. Uh, we spend money, we increase the value of the assets within the company, and we hope for some precipitating event uh, one day. We have got over seven million uh, pounds of cash. We, uh, in a year, will spend about two million pounds on running the biobank and our core infrastructure. As programs get towards the clinic, 
then we have to start paying external bills. But we're well financed to fund the LOCKS program and uh, get into 2018. Major shareholders, um, hopefully you'll be pleased to see that uh, Woodford is, is uh, a shareholder. He likes this sort of company. Lansdowne, uh, Richard Griffiths are well known for backing technology companies that have got potential to um, provide a major return to investors. The university are a key shareholder, uh, and obviously we, we collaborate with them locally. Uh, board and founders and then others, including some specialist life science investors uh, in the mix as well. So to conclude, we've got a different technology platform which we feel is better for identifying breakthrough therapies for these sorts of conditions. And we want it to be substantial and breakthrough in nature because that creates um, potentially very good events in the future. Uh, we've licensed our first uh, program to AstraZeneca and that's progressing well and is due to read out next year. Uh, we have got the first of our new programs announced and that's progressing well. And once again, we'll be starting clinical trials next year. Uh, we're well backed and we're looking to bring other assets into the company as well. Thank you. Perfect timing. Perfect to the, to timing. the second. <laughs> um, any questions, anybody? Two hands on the go. We'll take one on the left first and then come to the gentleman after. You're, um, you deal with AstraZeneca. Presumably, they're going to have to do a, a big phase three study at yep. some stage. Yep. So what's your estimated time to market for the product? Time to market. We predict it will get to market in the early 2020s. I don't, okay. I don't suppose you're allowed to tell us what, what the royalty rates are. Uh, I'll give you an indication. So uh, we've publicly announced that I think they start, well, I know exactly what they are, but <laughs> roughly speaking, they start in the single digits and escalate to mid-teens. So with royalties, with this sort of deal, for AZ, when they bring their first $300 million in, for example, that would be the hardest $300 million to get in through the door. So their margins are lower, so they pay us a lower percentage on that um, level. When you get you know, into the billions, then that's easier money and we've got a higher percentage of it. Which you can see, you know, if this, if this makes it to market, it's going to be huge, in my personal opinion. And those royalties will be painful for a company like AstraZeneca. Gentleman over here. Uh, good evening, Hi. Richard. Hi. Um, how does the um, addressable market size um, compare for pulmonary fibrosis and cystic fibrosis? Which is the bigger opportunity for us? I, I think a successful drug in either condition would be similar. So you'll see a, a successful drug pulling in hundreds of millions of dollars towards a billion dollars of um, revenues for that, that sort of marketplace. With the fibrotic drug, the antifibrotic drug, it's got potential outside of IPF, so liver fibrosis and kidney fibrosis are huge markets in themselves. So overall, the LOX program might have more potential than a single disease uh, integration. more patients with uh, PF compared to CF? Yes. Not substantially more, but, but yes. Uh, can I ask another question about okay. the, um, the interferons um, study? Yeah. If it was successful, do you think AstraZeneca's strategy would be to try and get an indication to give it prophylactically rather than just as a, a, a treatment for exacerbations? Uh, potentially. Are there, are we, the way we see it working, you need, when you start to get a cold, I mean, you, don't, you don't need to defend yourself against viruses all the time, but it is, there's potential for it. But, using it when you start to get a cold as a patient. These patients know it's bad news. You know, we all get colds and very occasionally one will hit our chest, but you, know, you might have to have antibiotics. This sort of patient, when they get a cold, they dread it. They know what's gonna happen next and they'll be very motivated to use the drug at that time. And you're solving an expensive healthcare problem. So you'll be able to charge a premium price for this drug, and it's even more expensive and more problematic in COPD patients because what people are showing now is that a viral infection, that simple common cold virus, uh, goes down to their lungs, it does for all of us, but their lungs don't cope with it, and they're vulnerable to secondary bacterial infections and they'll get antibiotics for that. If they get really ill, then they'll end up in hospital, and mortality 
in COPD when you're hospitalized is somewhere between 10 and 20%. So you can see why there's a, a really big interest in uh, this sort of approach for COPD patients. Would it be self-medicated? I don't know, it goes a bit self-medicated, a bit like um, insulin. Um, if they know they're getting a cold, would they take it themselves or would they have to go to their doctors? Yeah, the only thing that would get in the way of that is the potential cost. So healthcare providers will want to have some form of management of that because you don't want anyone just, oh, getting a cold, start taking an expensive medication. So there will be some control of that. But these patients already self-medicate with antibiotics and steroids. So I, I think ultimately people will, with some sort of test system, whether it's based on symptoms, that, you know, it might be the local chemist who says, right, just tell me about this cold you've got. And they'll say, well, definitely got a sore throat, definitely got a change in nasal, nasal symptoms, Believe me, I'm getting, going down with a cold. Here's your drug. It's the way I believe it will work. Hi. Uh, I was oh, sorry, wondering... Sorry, after, after you. Okay. Nice to be oh, full uh, uh, <laughs> I can hear you, yeah. Are you, are you aware of any competitor using uh, interferon... Uh, interferon beta? No, yeah. no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I forgot what I was... Uh, using uh, stem cell method oh, to treat him. Fibrosis? Uh, no, I'm not. Um, it, it, there, there will be academic groups and other companies working on other approaches to IPF. What we've latched on to is something which is really implicated and of great interest to the large pharma companies who are our, our customers. We feel we're into a hot area um, and we worked our way into this through the models, through the technology, uh, the biobank um, approach and the models we've got. Richard, um, very exciting couple of uh, uh, projects going through there. Um, just going back to the biobank, and apologies if I missed this. Okay. Obviously, you, you, you've been doing it for quite a long time, and you've built up uh, you know, a, a whole load of stuff there, but it, what is stopping anybody else establishing a new biobank using uh, a similar bit of equipment to take uh, yeah. <clears throat> biopsy samples uh, from lungs and, and, and start developing uh, their own biobank? It's hard to do. So you, there is, it isn't patented. There's a lot of know-how, and you need the infrastructure. So you, know, you could go and sort of put yourselves next to a private hospital um, somewhere and do these bronchoscopy procedures. Um, you know, having the ethics approval that we've got to be able to do this, um, processing the cells afterwards, you need your lab set up next to it. It's, it's complicated and difficult to do. Academic groups do this all over the world. Um, and it tends to be where a highly motivated um, physician doing a PhD or, or something like that will do maybe 20 or 30 bronchoscopies on some patients and run a, a project, and that project will last two years. That's, that tends to be the pattern, and that's how the interferon beta program was discovered in the first place. It was a very highly motivated workaholic of a medic who, who, who did that. So it, it is something that could be replicated, but it is hard to do, and we've got it up and running, we've got a license from the Human Tissue Authority, we've got an ethics approval, we've got freezers um, full of samples, but it also works like a current account. So some of those cells you want to work on immediately, and they're only good for five days. Other cell types are good for six weeks, and others can be frozen. So it works a bit like a current account and a deposit account. Uh, and it's, it, it, you have to, characterize the patients, uh, is, you know, getting an asthma cell is next to useless to you unless you know everything about that patient, whether they smoked, what drugs they're on, what drives their asthma, um, how old they are, and then you can get someone who matches that patient who hasn't got asthma, who's just happy to help with medical research. And, and so, all the bits of material you can freeze and hang on to for a large number of years? Yeah, it? yeah. Well, if it's something that has to be used fresh, then we uh, we don't have to start a new research program and apply for what we call ethics approval and then eight weeks later you can start it. We can put a radio advert out you know, the next day saying if, you, if your asthma gets worse when you get a cold, please could you contact this number and our clinical team will then talk to the patient and arrange for them to come in for a bronchoscopy which could be the next week. And that's the, the beauty of it. Um, so. and final question. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, injectable beta interferon mm -hmm. I believe is a very expensive medication. Will the inhalable version of beta interferon be as expensive? Um, I can.
cannot, I'm not allowed to comment on that. So that's yeah. AstraZeneca's business. All I would say is you're, you're solving an expensive problem. So when these people get ill, health economically, it's an expensive problem, especially if they end up in hospital. And the drugs they use is, is a bit bizarre, but if you're an asthmatic patient or a COPD patient who gets into trouble because a cold hit your chest, you get given oral steroids, which are cheap as chips, but not nice to have to take. They're not good for your bones, they can cause diabetes, and they're a necessary evil, so doctors want to avoid that. But health economically, which is an amalgam of the impact on the person and the direct costs, this is, an, this is a real medical problem. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Richard. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.